History of Ancient Egypt, Wikipedia Audio The history of ancient Egypt spans the period from the early prehistoric settlements of the Northern Nile Valley to the Roman conquest, in 30 BC. The Pharaonic period is dated from the 32nd century BC, when Upper and Lower Egypt were unified, until the country fell under Macedonian rule in 332 BC. Egypt's history is split into several different periods according to the ruling dynasty of each pharaoh. The dating of events is still a subject of research. The conservative dates are not supported by any reliable absolute date for a span of about three millennia. The following is the list according to conventional Egyptian chronology. The Nile has been the lifeline for Egyptian culture since nomadic hunter-gatherers began living along it during the Pleistocene. Traces of these early people appear in the form of artifacts and rock carvings along the terraces of the Nile and in the oases. To the Egyptians the Nile meant life and the desert meant death, though the desert did provide them protection from invaders. Chronology Along the Nile in the 12th millennium, an upper Paleolithic grain grinding culture using the earliest type of sickle blades had replaced the culture of hunting, fishing, and hunter-gatherers using stone tools. Evidence also indicates human habitation and cattle herding in the southwestern corner of Egypt near the Sudan border before the 8th millennium BC. Despite this, the idea of an independent bovine domestication event in Africa must be abandoned because subsequent evidence gathered over a period of 30 years has failed to corroborate this. Prehistoric Egypt, Nakata III, Early Dynastic Period, Old Kingdom, First Intermediate Period, Middle Kingdom, Second Intermediate Period, New Kingdom, Third Intermediate Period, Late period. The oldest known domesticated cattle remains in Africa are from the Fayum C 4400 BC. Geological evidence and computer climate modeling studies suggest that natural climate changes around the 8th millennium began to desiccate the extensive pastoral lands of North Africa, eventually forming the Sahara by the 25th century BC. Continued desiccation forced the early ancestors of the Egyptians to settle around the Nile more permanently and forced them to adopt a more sedentary lifestyle. However, the period from 9th to the 6th millennium BC has left very little in the way of archaeological evidence. The Nile Valley of Egypt was basically uninhabitable until the work of clearing and irrigating the land along the banks was started. However it appears that this clearance and irrigation was largely underway by the 6th millennium. By that time, Nile society was already engaged in organized agriculture and the construction of large buildings. At this time, Egyptians in the southwestern corner of Egypt were herding cattle and also constructing large buildings. Mortar was in use by the 4th millennium. The people of the valley and the Nile Delta were self-sufficient and were raising barley and emmer, an early variety of wheat, and stored it in pits lined with reed mats. They raised cattle, goats, and pigs and they wove linen and baskets. Prehistory continues through this time, variously held to begin with the Amrit Yen culture. Between 5500 BC and the 31st century BC, small settlements flourished along the Nile, whose delta empties into the Mediterranean Sea. The Tasian culture was the next to appear, it existed in Upper Egypt starting about 4500 BC. This group is named for the burials found at Deir Tassa a site on the east bank of the Nile between Asiat and Akamim. The Tasian culture is notable for producing the earliest blacktop ware, a type of red and brown pottery painted black on its top and interior. The Battery Culture, 
named for the battery site near Deir Tassa, followed the Tasian, however, similarities mean many avoid differentiating between them at all. The battery culture continued to produce the kind of pottery called blacktop ware, and was assigned the sequence dating numbers between 21 and 29. The significant difference, however, between the Tasian and battery, which prevents scholars from completely merging the two, is that battery sites are chalcolithic while the Tasian sites remained Neolithic and are thus considered technically part of the Stone Age. Neolithic Egypt The Amrit Yen culture is named after the site of El Amret, about 120 km south of Battery. El Amre was the first site where this culture was found unmingled with the later Jerze culture. However, this period is better attested at Nagata, and so is also referred to as the Nagata I culture. Black topped ware continued to be produced, but white cross line ware, a type of pottery decorated with close parallel white lines crossed by another set of close parallel white lines began to be produced during this time. The Amrit Yen period falls between SD 30 and 39. Newly excavated objects indicate that trade between Upper and Lower Egypt existed at this time. A stone vase from the north was found at El Amret, and copper, which is not present in Egypt, was apparently imported from the Sinai Peninsula or perhaps Nubia. Obsidian and an extremely small amount of gold were both definitively imported from Nubia during this time. Trade with the oases was also likely. The Jerzet culture, named after the site of El Jerzet, was the next stage in cultural development, and it was during this time that the foundation for ancient Egypt was laid. The Jerzet culture was largely an unbroken development out of the Amrit Yen starting in the Nile Delta and moving south through Upper Egypt, however, it failed to dislodge the Amrit Yen in Nubia. The Jerza culture coincided with a significant drop in rainfall and farming produced the vast majority of food. With increased food supplies, the populace adopted a much more sedentary lifestyle, and the larger settlements grew to cities of about 5,000 residents. It was in this time that the city dwellers started using adobe to build their cities. Copper instead of stone was increasingly used to make tools and weaponry. Silver, gold, lapis lazuli and Egyptian faience were used ornamentally, and the cosmetic palettes used for eye paint since the battery culture began to be adorned with reliefs. By the 33rd century BC, just before the first dynasty of Egypt, Egypt was divided into two kingdoms known from later times as Upper Egypt to the south and Lower Egypt to the north. The dividing line was drawn roughly in the area of modern Cairo. The historical records of ancient Egypt begin with Egypt as a unified state, which occurred sometime around 3150 BC. According to Egyptian tradition, Menes, thought to have unified Upper and Lower Egypt, was the first king. This Egyptian culture, customs, art expression, architecture and social structure was closely tied to religion, remarkably stable, and changed little over a period of nearly 3,000 years. Egyptian chronology, which involves regnal years, began around this time. The conventional chronology was accepted during the 20th century, but it does not include any of the major revision proposals that also have been made in that time. Even within a single work, archaeologists often offer several possible dates, or even several whole chronologies as possibilities. Consequently, there may be discrepancies between dates shown here and in articles on particular rulers or topics related to ancient Egypt. There also are several possible spellings of the names. Typically, 
Egyptologists divide the history of pharaonic civilization using a schedule laid out first by Manetho S. Egyptsheka, which was written during the Ptolemaic Kingdom during the 3rd century BC. Prior to the unification of Egypt, the land was settled with autonomous villages. With the early dynasties, and for much of Egypt's history thereafter, the country came to be known as the Two Lands. The pharaohs established a national administration and appointed royal governors. According to Manetho, the first pharaoh was Menes, but archaeological findings support the view that the first ruler to claim to have united the two lands was Narmer, the final king of the Nakata III period. His name is known primarily from the famous Narmer palette whose scenes have been interpreted as the act of uniting Upper and Lower Egypt. Menes is now thought to be one of the titles of Horaha, the second pharaoh of the First Dynasty. Neolithic Period Prehistoric Egypt Funeral practices for the elite resulted in the construction of mastabas, which later became models for subsequent Old Kingdom constructions such as the Steppe Pyramid, thought to have originated during the Third Dynasty of Egypt. Dynastic Egypt Early Dynastic Period Old Kingdom First Intermediate Period Middle Kingdom the Old Kingdom is most commonly regarded as spanning the period of time when Egypt was ruled by the Third Dynasty through to the Sixth Dynasty. The royal capital of Egypt during this period was located at Memphis, where Djoser established his court. The Old Kingdom is perhaps best known, however, for the large number of pyramids, which were constructed at this time as pharaonic burial places. For this reason, this epoch is frequently referred to as the Age of the Pyramids. The first notable pharaoh of the Old Kingdom was Djoser of the Third Dynasty, who ordered the construction of the first pyramid, the Pyramid of Djoser, in Memphis necropolis of Saqqara. It was in this era that formerly independent states became gnomes ruled solely by the pharaoh. Former local rulers were forced to assume the role of nomarch or work as tax collectors. Egyptians in this era worshipped the pharaoh as a god, believing that he ensured the annual flooding of the Nile that was necessary for their crops. Second Intermediate Period and the Hyksos The Old Kingdom and its royal power reached their zenith under the Fourth Dynasty. Sneferu the dynasty's founder, is believed to have commissioned at least three pyramids, while his son and successor Khufu erected the Great Pyramid of Giza, Sneferu had more stone and brick moved than any other pharaoh. Khufu, his son Khafra, and his grandson Menkor all achieved lasting fame in the construction of the Giza Pyramid Complex. To organize and feed the manpower needed to create these pyramids required a centralized government with extensive powers, and Egyptologists believe the Old Kingdom at this time demonstrated this level of sophistication. Recent excavations near the pyramids led by Mark Lehner have uncovered a large city that seems to have housed, fed and supplied the pyramid workers. Although it was once believed that slaves built these monuments, a theory based on the Exodus narrative of the Hebrew Bible, study of the tombs of the workmen, who oversaw construction on the pyramids, has shown they were built by a corvée of peasants drawn from across Egypt. They apparently worked while the annual flood covered their fields, as well as a very large crew of specialists, including stonecutters, painters, mathematicians, and priests. The Fifth Dynasty began with Userkov c. 2495 BC and was marked by the growing importance of the cult of the sun god R.A. Consequently, less efforts were devoted to the construction of pyramid complexes than during the Fourth Dynasty and more to the construction of sun temples in Abuzur. 
The decoration of pyramid complexes grew more elaborate during the dynasty and its last king, Unas, was the first to have the pyramid texts inscribed in his pyramid. Egypt's expanding interests in trade goods such as ebony, incense such as myrrh and frankincense, gold, copper, and other useful metals compelled the ancient Egyptians to navigate the open seas. Evidence from the Pyramid of Sahur, second king of the dynasty, shows that a regular trade existed with the Syrian coast to procure cedar wood. Pharaohs also launched expeditions to the famed land of Punt, possibly the Horn of Africa, for ebony, ivory and aromatic resins. During the Sixth Dynasty, the power of pharaohs gradually weakened in favor of powerful nomarchs. These no longer belonged to the royal family and their charge became hereditary, thus creating local dynasties largely independent from the central authority of the pharaoh. Internal disorders set in during the incredibly long reign of Pepi II Neferkair towards the end of the dynasty. His death, certainly well past that of his intended heirs, might have created succession struggles and the country slipped into civil wars mere decades after the close of Pepi II's reign. The final blow came when the 4.2 kilo year event struck the region in the 22nd century BC, producing consistently low Nile flood levels. The result was the collapse of the Old Kingdom followed by decades of famine and strife. After the fall of the Old Kingdom came a roughly 200-year stretch of time known as the First Intermediate Period, which is generally thought to include a relatively obscure set of pharaohs running from the end of the 6th to the 10th and most of the 11th dynasties. Most of these were likely local monarchs who did not hold much power outside of their gnome. There are a number of texts known as lamentations from the early period of the subsequent Middle Kingdom that may shed some light on what happened during this period. Some of these texts reflect on the breakdown of rule, others allude to invasion by Asiatic bowmen. In general the stories focus on a society where the natural order of things in both society and nature was overthrown. It is also highly likely that it was during this period that all of the pyramid and tomb complexes were robbed. Further lamentation texts allude to this fact, and by the beginning of the Middle Kingdom mummies are found decorated with magical spells that were once exclusive to the pyramid of the kings of the Sixth Dynasty. New Kingdom By 2160 BC, a new line of pharaohs, the 9th and 10th dynasties, consolidated Lower Egypt from their capital in Heracleopolis Magna. A rival line, the 11th dynasty based at Thebes, reunited Upper Egypt, and a clash between the rival dynasties was inevitable. Around 2055 BC, the Theban forces defeated the Heracleopolitan pharaohs and reunited the two lands. The reign of its first pharaoh, Mentuhotep II, marks the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom is the period in the history of ancient Egypt stretching from the 39th regnal year of Mentuhotep II of the 11th dynasty to the end of the 13th dynasty, roughly between 2030 and 1650 BC. 18th Dynasty the period comprises two phases, the 11th dynasty, which ruled from Thebes, and then the 12th dynasty, whose capital was Lijd. These two dynasties were originally considered the full extent of this unified kingdom, but some historians now consider the first part of the 13th dynasty to belong to the Middle Kingdom. The earliest pharaohs of the Middle Kingdom traced their origin to two nomarchs of Thebes, Intef the Elder, who served a Heracleopolitan pharaoh of the 10th dynasty, and his successor, Mentuhotep I. The successor of the latter, Intef I, was the first Theban nomarch to claim a Horus name and thus the throne of Egypt. 
he is considered the first pharaoh of the 11th dynasty. His claims brought the Thebans into conflict with the rulers of the 10th dynasty. Intefi and his brother Intef II undertook several campaigns northwards and finally captured the important gnome of Abydus. 19th Dynasty 20th Dynasty Third Intermediate Period Warfare continued intermittently between the Thebian and Heracleopolitan dynasties until the 39th regnal year of Mentuhotep II, second successor of Intef II. At this point, the Heracleopolitans were defeated and the Theban dynasty consolidated their rule over Egypt. Mentuhotep II is known to have commanded military campaigns south into Nubia, which had gained its independence during the First Intermediate Period. There is also evidence for military actions against the southern Levant. The king reorganized the country and placed a vizier at the head of civil administration for the country. Mentuhotep II was succeeded by his son, Mentuhotep III, who organized an expedition to Punt. His reign saw the realization of some of the finest Egyptian carvings. Mentuhotep III was succeeded by Mentuhotep IV, the final pharaoh of this dynasty. Despite being absent from various lists of pharaohs, his reign is attested from a few inscriptions in Wadi Hammamat that record expeditions to the Red Sea coast and to Quarry Stone for the royal monuments. The leader of this expedition was his vizier Aminemhat, who is widely assumed to be the future pharaoh Aminemhat I, the first pharaoh of the 12th dynasty. Aminemhat is therefore assumed by some Egyptologists to have either usurped the throne or assumed power after Mentuhotep IV died childless. Aminemhat I built a new capital for Egypt, Itjatai, thought to be located near the present Dalajd, although Manetho claims the capital remained at Thebes. Aminemhat forcibly pacified internal unrest, curtailed the rights of the nomarchs, and is known to have at launched at least one campaign into Nubia. His son Sanusredi continued the policy of his father to recapture Nubia and other territories lost during the First Intermediate Period. The Libya were subdued under his 45-year reign and Egypt's prosperity and security were secured. Sanusred III was a warrior king, leading his troops deep into Nubia and built a series of massive forts throughout the country to establish Egypt's formal boundaries with the unconquered areas of its territory. Aminemhat III is considered the last great pharaoh of the Middle Kingdom. Egypt's population began to exceed food production levels during the reign of Aminemhat III, who then ordered the exploitation of the Fayum and increased mining operations in the Sinai Peninsula. He also invited settlers from Western Asia to Egypt to labor on Egypt's monuments. Late in his reign, the annual floods along the Nile began to fail, further straining the resources of the government. The 13th dynasty and 14th dynasty witnessed the slow decline of Egypt into the Second Intermediate Period in which some of the settlers invited by Amenemhat III would seize power as the Hyksos. The Second Intermediate Period marks a period when Egypt once again fell into disarray between the end of the Middle Kingdom and the start of the New Kingdom. This period is best known as the time the Hyksos made their appearance in Egypt, the reigns of its kings comprising the 15th Dynasty. The 13th Dynasty proved unable to hold on to the long land of Egypt and a provincial family of Levantine descent located in the marshes of the eastern delta at Avaris broke away from the central authority to form the 14th dynasty. The splintering of the land most likely happened shortly after the reigns of the powerful 13th dynasty pharaohs Neferhotep I and Sobekhotep IV c. 1720 BC. While the 14th dynasty was Levantine, 
the Hyksos first appeared in Egypt c. 1650 BC when they took control of Avaris and rapidly moved south to Memphis, thereby ending the 13th and 14th dynasties. The outlines of the traditional account of the invasion of the land by the Hyksos is preserved in the Egyp Sheka of Manetho, who records that during this time the Hyksos overran Egypt, led by Salitus, the founder of the 15th dynasty. More recently, however, the idea of a simple migration, with little or no violence involved, has gained some support. Under this theory, the Egyptian rulers of the 13th and 14th dynasties were unable to stop these new migrants from traveling to Egypt from the Levant because their kingdoms were struggling to cope with various domestic problems, including possibly famine and plague. Be it military or peaceful, the weakened state of the 13th and 14th dynasty kingdoms could explain why they rapidly fell to the emerging Hyksos power. The Hyksos princes and chieftains ruled in the eastern delta with their local Egyptian vassals. The 15th dynasty rulers established their capital and seat of government at Memphis and their summer residence at Avaris. The Hyksos kingdom was centered in the eastern Nile Delta and central Egypt but relentlessly pushed south for the control of central and upper Egypt. Around the time Memphis fell to the Hyksos, the native Egyptian ruling house in Thebes declared its independence and set itself up as the 16th dynasty. Another short-lived dynasty might have done the same in central Egypt, profiting from the power vacuum created by the fall of the 13th dynasty and forming the Abydos dynasty. By 1600 BC, the Hyksos had successfully moved south in central Egypt, eliminating the Abydos dynasty and directly threatening the 16th dynasty. The latter was to prove unable to resist and Thebes fell to the Hyksos for a very short period c. 1580 BC. The Hyksos rapidly withdrew to the north and Thebes regained some independence under the 17th dynasty. From then on, Hyksos relations with the south seem to have been mainly of a commercial nature although Theban princes appear to have recognized the Hyksos rulers and may possibly have provided them with tribute for a period. The 17th dynasty was to prove the salvation of Egypt and would eventually lead the war of liberation that drove the Hyksos back into Asia. The two last kings of this dynasty were Sikhanenra Tau and Kamos. Amos I completed the conquest and expulsion of the Hyksos from the Nile Delta, restored Theban rule over the whole of Egypt and successfully reasserted Egyptian power in its formerly subject territories of Nubia and the southern Levant. His reign marks this beginning of the 18th dynasty and the New Kingdom. Possibly as a result of the foreign rule of the Hyksos during the Second Intermediate Period, the New Kingdom saw Egypt attempt to create a buffer between the Levant and Egypt, and attain its greatest territorial extent. It expanded far south into Nubia and held wide territories in the Near East. Egyptian armies fought Hittite armies for control of modern-day Syria. This was a time of great wealth and power for Egypt. Some of the most important and best-known pharaohs ruled at this time. Hatshepsut was a pharaoh at this time. Hatshepsut is unusual as she was a female pharaoh, a rare occurrence in Egyptian history. She was an ambitious and competent leader, extending Egyptian trade south into present-day Somalia and north into the Mediterranean. She ruled for 20 years through a combination of widespread propaganda and deft political skill. Her CO regent and successor Thutmose III expanded Egypt's army and wielded it with great success. Late in his reign he ordered her name hacked out from her monuments. He fought against Asiatic people and was the most successful of Egyptian pharaohs. Amenhotep III built extensively at the Temple of Karnak including the Luxor Temple, 
which consisted of two pylons, a colonnade behind the new temple entrance, and a new temple to the goddess Mat. Ramesses I reigned for two years and was succeeded by his son Seti I. Seti I carried on the work of Horem Hab in restoring power, control, and respect to Egypt. He also was responsible for creating the temple complex at Abydos. Arguably ancient Egypt's power as a nation-state peaked during the reign of Ramesses II of the 19th dynasty. He reigned for 67 years from the age of 18 and carried on his immediate predecessor's work and created many more splendid temples, such as that of Abu Simbel temples on the Nubian border. He sought to recover territories in the Levant that had been held by the 18th dynasty. His campaigns of reconquest culminated in the Battle of Kadesh in 1274 BC, where he led Egyptian armies against those of the Hittite king Muwatali II and was caught in history's first recorded military ambush. Ramesses II was famed for the huge number of children he sired by his various wives and concubines. The tomb he built for his sons in the Valley of the Kings has proven to be the largest funerary complex in Egypt. His immediate successors continued the military campaigns, though an increasingly troubled court complicated matters. Ramesses II was succeeded by his son Merneptah and then by Merenta's son Seti II. Seti II's throne seems to have been disputed by his half-brother Amen Messe who may have temporarily ruled from Thebes. Upon his death, Seti II son Sipta, who may have been afflicted with poliomyelitis during his life, was appointed to the throne by Chancellor Bey, a West Asian commoner who served as vizier behind the scenes. At Sipta's early death, the throne was assumed by Tusret, the queen dowager of Seti II and possibly Amen Messe's sister. A period of anarchy at the end of Tusret's short reign saw a native reaction to foreign control leading to the execution of Bey and the enthronement of Setnept, establishing the 20th dynasty. The last great pharaoh from the New Kingdom is widely considered Ramesses III, the son of Setnept who reigned three decades after the time of Ramesses II, who reigned 1279-1213 BC. In year 8 of his reign, the sea people invaded Egypt by land and sea. Ramesses III defeated them in two great land and sea battles. He claimed that he incorporated them as subject people and settled them in southern Canaan, although there is evidence that they forced their way into Canaan. Their presence in Canaan may have contributed to the formation of new states in this region such as Philistia after the collapse of the Egyptian Empire. He was also compelled to fight invading Libyan tribesmen in two major campaigns in Egypt's western delta in his year 6 and year 11 respectively. The heavy cost of these battles slowly exhausted Egypt's treasury and contributed to the gradual decline of the Egyptian Empire in Asia. The severity of these difficulties is stressed by the fact that the first known strike action in recorded history occurred during year 29 of Ramesses III's reign, when the food rations for the Egypt's favored and elite royal tomb builders and artisans in the village of Deir el Medina could not be provisioned. Something in the air prevented much sunlight from reaching the ground and also arrested global tree growth for almost two full decades until 1140 BC. One proposed cause is the Hekla III eruption in Iceland, but the dating of that event remains in dispute. Following Ramesses III's death there was endless bickering between his heirs. Three of his sons would go on to assume power as Ramesses IV, Ramesses VI, and Ramesses VIII, respectively. However, at this time Egypt was also increasingly beset by a series of droughts, below normal flooding levels of the Nile, famine, civil unrest, and official corruption. The power of the last pharaoh, Ramesses XI, 
grew so weak that in the south the Theban high priests of Ammon became the effective de facto rulers of Upper Egypt, whilst Mendes controlled Lower Egypt even before Ramesses' excise death. Smendes would eventually found the 21st dynasty at Tanis. After the death of Ramesses XI, his successor Smendes ruled from the city of Tanis in the north, while the high priests of Ammon at Thebes had effective rule of the south of the country, whilst still nominally recognizing Smendes as king. In fact, this division was less significant than it seems since both priests and pharaohs came from the same family. Piank, assumed control of Upper Egypt, ruling from Thebes, with the northern limit of his control ending at al -Hiba. The country was once again split into two parts with the priests in Thebes and the pharaohs at Tanis. Their reign seems without other distinction, and they were replaced without any apparent struggle by the Libyan kings of the 22nd dynasty. Egypt has long had ties with Libya, and the first king of the new dynasty, Shoshenkai, was a Meshwish Libyan, who served as the commander of the armies under the last ruler of the 21st dynasty, Sassens II. He unified the country putting control of the Amun clergy under his own son as the high priest of Amun, a post that was previously a hereditary appointment. The scant and patchy nature of the written records from this period suggest that it was unsettled. There appear to have been many subversive groups, which eventually led to the creation of the 23rd dynasty, which ran concurrent with the latter part of the 22nd dynasty. The country was reunited by the 22nd dynasty founded by Shoshenkai in 945 BC, who descended from Meshwish immigrants, originally from ancient Libya. This brought stability to the country for well over a century. After the reign of Azarkan II the country had again splintered into two states with Shoshenk III of the 22nd dynasty controlling Lower Egypt by 818 BC while Taklo II and his son ruled Middle and Upper Egypt. After the withdrawal of Egypt from Nubia at the end of the New Kingdom, a native dynasty took control of Nubia. Under King Pai, the Nubian founder of 25th dynasty, the Nubians pushed north in an effort to crush his Libyan opponents ruling in the Delta. Pi managed to attain power as far as Memphis. His opponent Tefnacht ultimately submitted to him, but he was allowed to remain in power in Lower Egypt and founded the short-lived 24th dynasty at Sais. The Kashite kingdom to the south took full advantage of this division and political instability and defeated the combined might of several native Egyptian rulers such as Pafjabast, Azarkan IV of Tanis, and Tefnacht of Sais. Pi established the Nubian 25th dynasty and appointed the defeated rulers as his provincial governors. He was succeeded first by his brother, Shabaka, and then by his two sons Shabitku and Taharka. Taharka reunited the two lands of northern and southern Egypt and created an empire that was as large as it had been since the New Kingdom. The 25th dynasty ushered in a renaissance period for ancient Egypt. Religion, the arts, and architecture were restored to their glorious old, middle, and new kingdom forms. Pharaohs, such as Taharka, built or restored temples and monuments throughout the Nile Valley, including at Memphis, Karnak, Kawa, Jebel Barkal, etc. It was during the 25th dynasty that the Nile Valley saw the first widespread construction of pyramids since the Middle Kingdom. The international prestige of Egypt declined considerably by this time. The country's international allies had fallen under the sphere of influence of Assyria and from about 700 BC the question became when, not if, there would be war between the two states. Taharka's reign and that of his successor, Tanudamun, 
were filled with constant conflict with the Assyrians against whom there were numerous victories, but ultimately Thebes was occupied and Memphis sacked. From 671 BC on, Memphis and the Delta region became the target of many attacks from the Assyrians, who expelled the Nubians and handed over power to client kings of the 26th dynasty. Samtakai was the first recognized as the king of the whole of Egypt, and he brought increased stability to the country during a 54-year reign from the new capital of Sais. Four successive Set kings continued guiding Egypt successfully and peacefully from 610-526 BC, keeping the Babylonians in certain measures away with the help of Greek mercenaries. However, during this period Babylonian Emperor Nebuchadnezzar II campaigned against the Egyptians and drove them back over the Sinai. And in 567 BC he went to war with Pharaoh Amasis, and briefly invaded Egypt itself. By the end of this period a new power was growing in the Near East, Persia. The pharaoh Samtuk III had to face the might of Persia at Pelusium, he was defeated and briefly escaped to Memphis, but ultimately was captured and then executed. Achaemenid Egypt can be divided into three eras, the first period of Persian occupation when Egypt became a satrapy, followed by an interval of independence, and the second and final period of occupation. The Persian king Cambyses assumed the formal title of pharaoh, called himself Masudiri, and sacrificed to the Egyptian gods. He founded the 27th dynasty. Egypt was then joined with Cyprus and Phoenicia in the sixth satrapy of the Achaemenid Empire. Cambyses' successors Darius I the Great and Xerxes pursued a similar policy, visited the country, and warded off an Athenian attack. It is likely that Artaxerxes I and Darius II visited the country as well, although it is not attested in our sources and did not prevent the Egyptians from feeling unhappy. During the War of Succession after the reign of Darius II, which broke out in 404, they revolted under Amertius and regained their independence. This sole ruler of the 28th dynasty died in 399, and power went to the 29th dynasty. The 30th dynasty was established in 380 BC and lasted until 343 BC. Nectanebo II was the last native king to rule Egypt. Artaxerxes III reconquered the Nile Valley for a brief period. In 332 BC Mazaks handed over the country to Alexander the Great without a fight. The Achaemenid Empire had ended and for a while Egypt was a satrapy in Alexander's empire. Later the Ptolemies and then the Romans successively ruled the Nile Valley. In 332 BC Alexander III of Macedon conquered Egypt with little resistance from the Persians. He was welcomed by the Egyptians as a deliverer. He visited Memphis, and went on a pilgrimage to the Oracle of Amun at the oasis of Siwa. The oracle declared him the son of Amun. He conciliated the Egyptians by the respect he showed for their religion, but he appointed Greeks to virtually all the senior posts in the country, and founded a new Greek city, Alexandria, to be the new capital. The wealth of Egypt could now be harnessed for Alexander's conquest of the rest of the Persian Empire. Early in 331 BC he was ready to depart, and led his forces away to Phoenicia. He left Cleomenes as the ruling nomarch to control Egypt in his absence. Alexander never returned to Egypt. Following Alexander's death in Babylon in 323 BC, a succession crisis erupted among his generals. Initially, Perdiccas ruled the empire as regent for Alexander's half-brother Hydeus, who became Philip III of Macedon, 
and then as regent for both Philip III and Alexander's infant son Alexander IV of Macedon, who had not been born at the time of his father's death. Perdiccas appointed Ptolemy, one of Alexander's closest companions, to be satrap of Egypt. Ptolemy ruled Egypt from 323 BC, nominally in the name of the joint kings Philip III and Alexander IV. However, as Alexander the Great's empire disintegrated, Ptolemy soon established himself as ruler in his own right. Ptolemy successfully defended Egypt against an invasion by Perdiccas in 321 BC, and consolidated his position in Egypt and the surrounding areas during the wars of the Diadochi. In 305 BC, Ptolemy took the title of king. As Ptolemy I Soter, he founded the Ptolemaic dynasty that was to rule Egypt for nearly 300 years. Late Period The later Ptolemies took on Egyptian traditions by marrying their siblings, had themselves portrayed on public monuments in Egyptian style and dress, and participated in Egyptian religious life. Hellenistic culture thrived in Egypt well after the Muslim conquest. The Ptolemies had to fight native rebellions and were involved in foreign and civil wars that led to the decline of the kingdom and its annexation by Rome. Persian Domination Ptolemaic Dynasty Pharaonic Egypt Ptolemaic Egypt <laughs>